Thanks anyway for coming on, man. Eh? It's good. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. All right. And we are rolling. Cool. So this week we have my old rugby coach, Martin Rothwell, from when we when I used to play at Loughborough uh, Rugby League. We kept in touch since then, and now he's just finishing up his PhD in an alternative mode of sports organization. Is that a correct way of saying ecological dynamics, or how would you how would you introduce it? Yeah, that that's I suppose that's the theoretical framework underpinning um, the, the the PhD, the work. Um, but specifically, I'm I'm looking at. <laughs> I suppose how socio-cultural constraints influence um, different athlete development environments um, and how that then has an influence on athlete behaviour in, in terms of performance behaviours. Yeah. So uh, very briefly, that's, that's what I was, that's what I'm, I've been studying for the past five years. So, yeah. Right. So I, I read, a, you sent me some papers a while back on this and I remember yeah. looking through and I remember one of the things that it was critiquing was this uh, traditional sort of block style approach that each diff, there's different categ subcategories within a sports organization that focuses on a different part of applied sports science and how that's not the, the correct sort of influence on, on cultural development. Is that correct? Um, if I if I think I'm following your question, um, that's something else. I sort of we've been looking at a, a few few colleagues um, across the uh, Carl Woods in Australia and uh, Keith Davids in the UK uh, and other other colleagues. Yeah, we've been we've been looking at this idea, this concept of something called a department of methodology, um, where where essentially we're sort of trying to challenge maybe the traditional idea that you have a strength and conditioner, a tactical technical coach, a performance analyst, um, maybe all working in different sort of working in silos. We all have very different ideas about um, uh, athlete development, human performance, um, and it's more of an integrated approach. Um, so you're almost blurring the lines between I'm an s &C coach, I'm a performance analyst, I'm a physio, and, and it's working um, within a department of methodology, one sort of team that's aimed at athlete performance or athlete preparation for performance. But the key to that, though, is underpinning that is a theoretical framework for uh, learning, human learning, um, that can provide common language concepts, principles of, of design, practice design, um, that, that everybody's working towards. So you're getting more of a collaborative, integrated effort. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that's what you meant, Brooks. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but what sort of the, how do we do what, how, what, what's some of the practices involved in it? So I, I, I understand that there's a, a yeah. it's like a critique against the traditional structures, but then yeah. what would be an example of, of this applied? And are there any examples of this, this work applied? Yeah, well, we've, we've, um, we've actually say just, uh, probably, well, a few months back, we had another paper published. So, uh, a, a guy we've been working with Fabian Otte is a, goalkeeping coach at Burnley, actually, in the Premier League. Um, another, well, Carl Woods again and Keith and I, we've, we've been, we've, we've basically provided some examples from real-world practice um, where, you know, multiple sub-disciplines are all working on, on similar performance problems or rate limiters in, in certain sports. So, so let's say, I don't know, so let's say rugby, for example, you've got you're trying to address a specific problem. It might be around defending as a team or unit or um, or attacking, whatever it might be. Um, and rather than it, traditionally what will happen, it, it, in the UK, in my experiences anyway, I don't know, obviously you guys have got experiences from around the world. but So it, that, that issue will normally lie on the shoulders of the head coach. Yeah, so, you know, who, who will typically have a very sort of strong background in, in the tactical and technical aspects of the sport. Um, and it just, it just might mean that, you know, we might want other information from the analyst. 
he might ask the S and C to do certain things, but generally it's very led um, by the head coach. So it's it's not necessarily a multidisciplinary approach to addressing that issue. It's sort of monodisciplinary. So so let's say it's it's defending in rugby. Obviously that that could be that could be multiple different things. It could be something to do with um, uh, it could be psychological issues. It could be um, strength, agility, uh, movement. Um, it could be team coordination or subunit coordination. So really, uh, it needs a it needs a coordinated and integrated effort to address that problem. So you know you might need very specific performance performance analyst data in terms of notation analysis and GPS to understand maybe. Uh, player loads, uh, speed, movement. Um, you know, it could be some. The psychologist could have something to. Uh, could, have, could could have some really useful input about uh, maybe things that they've seen or or uh, things they've noticed with certain players in in certain situations. So, so yeah. So it'd be a real integrated effort. So rather than just seeing, oh, we best get our S and C session in on Tuesday morning because that's the only time we've got, or, you know, I might see what, what data the, an analyst can give me. Rather than that, it's, it's everybody sat around the table trying to solve this problem of whatever it might be. Do you, do you get what I mean? Because then it's, you've, it's more collaborative. You, you, you're bringing in more insights into this problem. Yeah. So, to, so, so I can better understand it. Each, so you have the physio, you have the strength coach, and then you also have the analyst. In your line of work, those are three different people, right? So you'll have a specific, a specific person that just does uh, performance analytics. Yeah, typically, Mike. Yeah, and that um, that's what you get. That that will be their specialism. Um, so you know, you'll have a performance analyst. You know, all these different people that that will work in. Um, in these teams. So, I mean, if you look in the, let's take the English Premier League, for example, it's, you know, there's so much money that you could have a team of 10 analysts, a team of, you know, five or six strength and conditioners. Um, and, and appreciate the challenges with that, you know, bringing those people together to, to address these problems can be a challenge, but I think, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a way to go. It's more fruitful. I think if you're, if you're aiming to solve it, solve these problems, yeah, as a as 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 a performance preparation team, it's almost blurring the vision of or the line. Sorry, is oh, I'm only a I'm only a strength coach, or I'm only this or that or whatever. You know, it's yeah, it's more of a, a collaborative approach, really. But yeah, okay. that's not the PhD though, Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I might have misunderstood what you're asking, but yeah, no, sorry. no worries. So, so then, what's, so what, the what's the PhD then? Yeah, so so some something I've been really interested in over. I mean, I didn't realise at the time, but uh, God knows, maybe 15, 20 years, perhaps. I've I've always like wondered, you know, why certain practices, coaching practices, the way they are, or or you know, like certain teams. I don't know if you get it in American football, Mike, but certain teams in in rugby league, well, rugby league specifically, uh, is where the ideas have sort of stemmed from. I've always wondered why do they play that way, and maybe another team might play another way. Um, and you get it in football or soccer. Um, so, so yeah, and I mean this, and this is these ideas or these questions that I was asking myself were shaped from experience. So when I was in these environments and seeing things, and um, yeah, just just really curious, really. And then I started reading more, um, and I suppose it it's when I went to work at Sheffield Hallam that I started to get exposed to more um, sort of literature and people and talking to, to academics and other practitioners. And it started to shape these ideas around, you know, how different environmental constraints influence different practices and then how these practices then influence sort of athlete performance, you know, in competition. So, so yeah, so and and the way we've categorised that with you, I mean, so the the PhD really draws on certain different subdisciplines. So 
draws a bit on philosophy, um, skill acquisition uh, research or literature, um, coaching literature. Um, and to sort of sum it up, what, what I'm really interested in or what I've done for the past five years is, is one, try to categorise um, what these socio-cultural constraints are in rugby league, what are the dominant socio-cultural constraints and then how they influence player performance. Uh, and it's, um, so it, what I would say is the PhD is just the start. This is going to, this is a programmatic piece of work that I'll probably be studying for the rest of my academic career, you know, or professional career. Um, so, but, so initially we just try to characterize what the dominant sort of socio-cultural constraints are. Um, and then, theorize what that means for athlete performance from a ecological psychology perspective yeah so then the next step will be to test some of these ideas empirically yeah. so so you need to come up with categories and subcategories for every socioeconomical dynamic coupled with psychological dynamic and then somehow quantify those well <laughs> well, it's very qualitative. Yeah, it's not, it's not so much, we're not trying to measure anything or it's more of a qualitative piece of work, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it sits firmly in like, you know, an interpretivist paradigm, yeah. Gotcha. So, Which so, might, not be, might not be, yeah, necessarily down everyone's street, but yeah. <laughs> so how are you breaking these categories down then? Where, what are... I mean, so I've coached in team sport environments, both high school mm. and college and melting pot environments where, I mean, you have the rich of the rich and the poor, of the poor. Right? right. And, and you see the different personalities, um, the different home come, coming out, whether it's from money, home life, upbringing, right? Like every, everything just comes into play. I, I can't for I, I can't even begin to understand how you could possibly analyze all that shit. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's oh, a great point. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously in a in a team no, no, it's a great point. So in a team sport, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I suppose you've got what an American football squad, what you got, fifty players? Hundred. 100 players, yeah, that all bring with them very different, um, you know, attitudes, ideas, beliefs, whatever. Yeah, so that's a real challenge. But so I suppose that's at the micro level, Mike. What, I'm, what I've looked at is the macro level. So specifically, so I've used rugby league to study this because that's the sport I know and what I can, I can get access to different environments and what have you. So, so... I don't, I don't know if this is what you want for the pod, but so one of the, one of the, um, it's not so much a theoretical framework, but it, I suppose it's a theory really, but uh, a guy called Yuri Bronfrembrenner, he, he developed a, a conceptual model, a theoretical model, I suppose, um, of uh, human uh, development. So he, cat, he had four different, sort of subsystems and he argued that they all interact to influence human development so at the top you've got the macro level which would be um so if you if you take i don't know i'm trying to think of a in fact uh, you know detroit in the in the usa i mean I, I think by what i'm seeing and reading is that detroit's always had quite a hard physical masculine underpinning from like you know working on the factory line and you know, in the, the old olden days where they had the, the, the uh, automobile factories and all that type of thing. And then if you think about maybe the way the, the Kronk boxing gym, it's got a very physical, come forward sort of uh, boxing style. The Detroit Pistons, I know, have, have been at quite an aggressive physical team. So now, you know, looking at Bronfren Brenner's model, he would argue that that stems from cultural inheritance, i.e. you've got this real sort of um, hyper-masculine, disciplined attitude that embeds the city. And that then, in, that then uh, 
people then inherit these ideas, these values. So, at, so at the, the, the macro level. So I've been really trying to understand what the, what the dominant macro level is in rugby league. So just, just for your sake, Mike, really, is, so in the UK, rugby league's played in quite a small area. Yeah, in the, in the UK. And, it, and all these areas are very similar in regards to, um, I suppose, the historical values and, and, and the, the, they're all sort of uh, born out of the industrial, the old industrial area where, you, are, you know, you've got lots of sort of um, manual type work. Yeah, so, I, so I've looked at, at that and how that influences um, maybe ideals in rugby league and beliefs. Yeah, he's laughing, look. Yeah, so I, bro, to me, I, holy fuck, there, there are so many, there are so many circumstances where it just doesn't fit the mold, right? Like even, even in that, that whole like blue collar mentality essentially is, is the industrial feel, right? Like, oh, let's get that blue collar mentality. We're, we're here to work hard. We're, we're hard nosed players. Some of the hardest motherfuckers I've ever coached are the silver spoon motherfuckers. Like these kids that just kick the fucking shit out of everyone. And some of them are the richest fucking pussies on the face of the earth. They've wanted for nothing, right? Like I, some, so I, I, I can list, I can think of 10 guys off the top of my head. Meantime, some of the guys coming from the blue collar personnel or the blue collar environment, they're weak. They're weak. They're wieners. They got nothing to them, right? So I, 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 I see so many not not with your research, but like I, I see so many issues with even generalizing generalizing an area, or 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 in in this day and age in that way, right? Like I yeah. I, I feel like longer ago before you had the outside influences of the internet and the outside influences. Of, of everything else, like you, you, you could write only through, you could contact only by fucking mail, right? All you knew were your surroundings, but now there's so many outside perspectives coming in through this. Hey, do you think, are, are you struggling with any of this? Like, I, yeah, bro, so, I, I my, my head is spinning thinking about all this shit for you. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so what I would say with your point there, yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that just because someone comes from a Detroit, for example, that means they're going to, uh, you know, be physical, whatever. It's not suggesting that. It, what? Because something else we need to. So, uh, at the, so what? Back to what Bronfer and Brenner argued is that not only have you got the macro level influence in the individual, there's there's other things. So you've got the the uh, the meso system. So that's like things where, like the family family situation, um, schooling, all these type of things. But essentially personal dispositions can it sometimes it's irrelevant what the part of it's you know it, that's so unpredictable it's mm -hmm. yeah i suppose what what i'm saying is or what we're sort of writing about and and uh um sort of trying to understand more about is is what might be the dominant basically because of all these different socio-cultural um influences what might be the sort of dominant ideals in regards to sport performance but yeah, I mean, so, you know, I mean, there's been research I think, with uh, twins, for example, where, so obviously they've both, you know, twins have very similar home lives. They've got very similar genetics. And in sport, there has as well, you know, like long, longitudinal type studies where they're sort of developing very different trajectories. So we're not really suggesting that. It's more, it's more to understand that, you know, what, so, so let's say American football, you know, what, what would you say the dominant socio, what are the dominant sort of customs and values and beliefs in American football? You know, it's, it just depends. It really mm. does. Um, one, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm going to say majority of them come from middle class or lower. Right. Majority, majority of football players come from either the middle class lifestyle, uh, NFL football players come from middle, middle class or less. 
But I mean, I don't, I, I got a lot of rich kids that played in the NFL, you know, yeah. like I, and I, I think that's more, I don't know if that's related to socioeconomic or, or geographical as it is. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I've thought about this shit a lot too. I, I, I and, and I've talked about it with a lot of my players. Like, I'm not so, sure. Go on. Tell, tell me. Yeah. No, no. What I mean, sorry. I, I may have put the question. Uh, it might've been confusing why, the way I asked. I mean, so what I mean is, so in American football, what would you say, you know, the head coach, the way they sort of prepare the team and all the rest of it, because what I see in American football, it's like, it's so highly coach centered. So the coach is king and they'll have like play playbooks like this that so basically you're almost it's almost like um, you're almost playing a game of chess with the players you, there's, there's no autonomy for the players is what I'm seeing it's like you play in this play now you're going to play this play and there's a guy in the stand that will tell the guy on the side I'm seeing these things tell them to play this play to to um exploit the defence. Do, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So yes. it's, high, it's highly coach-centred. Um, I might be way off the mark here because I've, I've probably watched 20 minutes of a, you know, it's what I'm reading about and what I'm seeing uh, documentaries and that type of thing. So I apologise to any American football people, but the point I'm trying to make is there's a reason that's that way. Do you got know what I mean? There's a, there is a reason it's like that. You know, I remember, I remember uh, probably in the seventies or maybe a bit late later. Uh, uh, Australia, Australia, people from Australia went over to rugby league. People went over to America to get insights from the NFL, understand more about it, and um, you know they wanted to sort of get ideas about training and playing all these type of things. And then, so what that actually. Uh, instigated was um, a real professionalism of the way they train. So they started using weights and conditioning a lot, a lot of these ideas filtered into the, the American way of life, if you, or the American way of preparing players, uh, Australian way, sorry. Now that really fit with this Austra these Australian ideals that, uh, you know, uh, rugby league had to be really tough. It was about dominating your opposition player, and that's great, and, uh, and it's about that. There's, that you, there's no getting away from that. Same in American football. There's no getting away from that. That's part of the game. But the issue you have then, certainly with development pathways, is that people that might have other attributes at very young ages, so let's say, I don't know, 13, 14, teenagers, adolescents, who are still developing, they're still growing. But if they show other attributes like skill or dexterity or maybe things that doesn't conform with this really strong and powerful, uh, uh, you know, uh, way of doing it, it can then marginalise other skills and behaviours and attitudes. And, and I know, and I, I know sport is dog eat dog. You know what I mean? That's the way it is. And it, is it ever going to change? Probably not. But, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. Certainly in, in development pathways when it's, it's impossible to predict the next NFL star. They might show certain traits at, at a young age um, that you might think, oh, yeah, that, you know, strength or speed or whatever. But there's no way you can predict future players based on that. So that's problematic as well. So what you're saying in regards to the development of the skills associated with football leading to the marginalization of other skills for possibly other sports. Is that, is that what you're saying? So essentially spe sports specialization, specialization, is that what you're saying? So if, if we're thinking about just one sport, that's so for example, if we've got these, if we've got these ideals in sport about what, you know, player, player performance is or what, what attributes players need to, and, and quite clearly, we, we might understand some of them. Um, but it, if that's what it's always about, and that's what you're always looking for, you're going to get the you're going to get what you're always get. And but the issue is, you're going to marginalise 
players, you know, you're going to marginalise players, especially in, a, in the youth development pathways, which is what I've been looking at in, in the PhD. So, you know, so we, I did an ethnographic study for, for over a year where I was, I was a coach in, a, in, a, in an academy pathway and so many players were disregarded and their own, these kids were only 14 because they, they might have not have been deemed as physically tough enough. Um, they might not have showed um, uh, certain behaviours, what the coaches were expecting. And, the, and these expectations, these are not things that have been tested over years and years and years to say, well, we know if players demonstrate these, these attributes, these these um, behaviours, the more likely to get to the top. These were born out of maybe the way, maybe the way that things were done when they were playing over twenty years ago, or different attitudes about you know being tough or disciplined or masculine or whatever. And you know that's really quite dangerous. Not dangerous in people to get hurt, but but it's quite counterproductive. Yeah, I I can agree with that. So. What does your PhD have to do with this then? How do you, what are you, what are you doing with that? Yeah, so, so what, what we wanted to understand first is the different um, socio-cultural influences on, on this, on, on rugby league. And then once we've done that, um, or what, what I'm planning to what the sort of next steps, if you like, the, the next studies will be um, taking all this information we've got and trying to, and testing some of these ideas empirically. So we sort of know, we know what the dominant constraints are on performance in terms of socio-cultural. Um, but now we want to understand how that influences sort of player performance in, in competition so what are they, Ruffers? What are some of the constraints? Yeah, so uh, masculinity is one. Um, Hyper-disciplined behaviour in terms of um, technical skills. So there's this idea that um, there's an optimal way of moving. Yeah, so, and you, you can't move away from that. And if you do, you're deemed, oh, you, you're not skillful, even though a lot of these, these are just techniques. They're not skilled. So the technique's done with no environmental context. Do you know what I mean? They're all out of context. Um, yeah, they were, they're the two main things that, that just kept getting coming up time and time again. Um, and then using, using so um, an American uh, ecological psychologist, James Gibson, um, so he, he wrote a lot about um, something called affordances, so basically opportunities for action. Um, and that's so we use that theory to th to understand from a, a human movement perspective, a human uh, engaging with the environment, what that might mean. Um, so what we found was that the players were more were, would, would respond to opportunities to conform to these ideals, i.e. try and demonstrate that they're tough, try and um, produce these perfect techniques, whatever that was in regards to, you know, kicking, catching, passing, rather than try and explore the, the performance environment. So, um, you know, search, you know, search for opportunities to attack, even though that might mean um, making more mistakes, for example, which, which wouldn't uh, bode well for their development on the, or their progression on the pathway. So they were really constrained by these, what these expectations what the co these ex coach expectations of, of their behavior, yeah, their physical behavior. So then if I'm understanding correct, really what this is about is it's stopping the, the natural instincts of some sort of intuitive type mm. players to come out and to sort of challenge the way that, you know, current techniques are, I guess it's, you could probably use like the Fosbury flop. That yeah, this exactly example, that, yeah. Right? And seeing about people moving more creative creatively and progressive really progressing the sport so yeah i mean it's like seeing you've ever seen the the video of the the i think the triathletes where the guy ends up lying on the bike have you ever yeah. seen where he brings his feet off the pedal so he can zoom past everyone yeah. and stuff like that right yes yeah, yeah good good way yeah so 
Um, I know, and the issue is over time. If you've got a, if you've got players that, are, that you're suppressing these natural instincts to, I mean, I'm talking you know rugby, here, but to you know to keep exploring and uh, you know trying different ways to break the defence down. You know what I mean? Over time, that's going to really suppress their, um, you know, their their nat- like say their natural instincts. So we, you know, we need. We, I think, anyway, we need to really address this. Um, but there's this term path dependency where, you know, coaches have these ideals, these, these thoughts, these beliefs, attitudes, ways of doing things. And it's so hard to try and challenge those, those mm-hmm. assumptions. Mm-hmm. Very, very hard to challenge them. Yeah. I mean, um, I, see it. I see it over here in the ice hockey world. All of the old players that get into coaching, they start doing the same stuff and they say, well, this is what we did when yeah. I was younger. And it's just this continual, yeah. you know, recycling of ideas. And I mean, I think it's almost, you could even argue that this is seen in other parts of culture too. I mean, everyone's trying to copy everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Im- imitation. That was a, that was another one of the findings. Yeah. Coach. I mean, but I, that's, that's not specific to rugby league. That's, that's just sport, isn't it? People, people seem to imitate. There's no, you know what I mean? There's no f- framework or concept that's underpinning the way they're doing something. It's all, you know, of, of learning. They don't necessarily view athletes as learners and they don't use a learning framework to support those learners. It's, we'll do what we've always done or I'll, do the, I'll teach or coach the way I was coached. And that's a challenge. Yeah, that's so, a challenge. So I would have thought that then the best way to counter that would be to have then a much more open and sort of play style that guys get to go in and figure it all out. And is that the sort of the remedy to what you're you're saying is that then it's like unstructured sport practice or is there still some boundaries that you that you use? Well, yeah, that I mean that is I mean, um, we have this this continuum of at one end you've got a generality of practice, and at the other end you've got specificity of practice. And it's it's so specificity might be honing in on very specific skills and practicing those in you would hope in quite uh, in you know with lots of environmental context, so in game like situations. Whereas generality it could be. You know, it could, be, and this is where the, the S and C coach com, comes in. It, it's getting them to explore their range of movement abilities and really trying to challenge that and stretch that, with the idea that you know, if if you've got athletes that are, that are better movers, then they're more likely to engage in the specificity of practice a lot more effectively. But yeah, so I think people have got some ideas. I won't say answers because you know, testing these ideas over long periods with elite athletes is a challenge because it's just, you know, it's more case study type designs, but, but this is the point. How do you get some of these coaches to adopt these methods? Right. It's very, very, very challenging. I mean, yeah. what about like, let's like try and go with some ex- like good examples of like obvious successes in it. I mean, everyone loves the all blacks, right? And they're always talking about how, in terms of, you know, organizing the culture, that these are the leaders. I mean, from your perspective and with what you're looking at there with like ecological dynamics and social cultural factors, have the All Blacks got a good idea of it? Is this the best that we can see in terms of implementation? Yeah, well, look, I've, I've never seen that environment, but I've, I've read quite a bit around um, the All Blacks. And if you, if you, um, Steve Hansen wrote an article, well, if he wrote it, but he was heavily quoted in it and it was sort of a co-authorship, I think, a while back. Um, and his mantra was, or the Uts, not his, but the All Blacks mantra at the time was being, uh, and his idea about selection was that All Blacks have to be faster learners than somebody else. So straight away, putting the word learner in there, it, it totally reshapes the way practice looks. Right. Because if you're a le- if you're a learner, you're considered you're coming into this environment to learn. That's you've straight away the coaches have got a very different idea about their role in that process, supporting those athletes. So 
Yeah, so and you've got to be fast a faster learner than somebody else. So um so you know with that you know comes lots of empowerment um other stuff I've read about the All Blacks, you know, lots of empowerment. Um, there's lots of autonomy for the athletes to um, to decide on on the way they're going to play and, and these types of things. So, yeah, the, the All Blacks have definitely got um, have definitely got something right quite clearly because of the the way they perform, uh, the way they play, the types of players they produce. So, you know, they've not got this idea that you're a prop forward, your job is to push in the scrum or carry the ball over three or four metres. You know, you regularly you'll see um, prop forwards playing, making the final pass to score a try. Right. Uh, you know, and if and if we saw a standoff or a fly-off in Rugby Union doing that, it'd be like, oh, miracle pass. But that's, I think that's accepted with the All Blacks. Know that everybody's role is to exploit space you know, attack space, support the ball runner, all these types of things. So, so yeah, so they're doing something different quite clearly. Yeah. And actually, when you, when you actually read about New Zealand's history, very remote islands, you know, you, uh, like Mike was saying before, that, you know, you're not, you can't just, I mean, years and years ago, you can't, you couldn't have just gone to the, the local garage if your car broke down. You know, there's lots of farming. So there's a lot, there was lots of responsibility do things for yourself. Do you know what I mean? That's that's probably and it, I mean I don't know if it's still like that now. It's probably changed slightly with uh, the, the way the world is. But you know, so you can see where that that these ideas stem from in in New Zealand culture. Yeah. So do the All Blacks develop all their own players from a youth level, and then bring them through a system, or do they draft certain players? Because in the NFL, you don't. There's no development. You draft a player and then you hope he develops as, you know, a 22 year old. But I know with, with soccer or excuse me, with, with football from other countries, like they have, they have development levels from ages 12 and up, even, even younger. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know specifically the details, Mike, but it will be that way. Yeah. It will, it will be that way in rugby's, excuse me, most sort of, um, uh, Top t most of the top teams will have these sort of youth development pathways from like yeah 12 13 all the way through to yeah and and you know what's even more remarkable is you know we have this belief don't we that oh more is better we just get more at the base and therefore you're going to get but i mean what's the population in new zealand is it two million or five million something like that isn't it it's it's, it's nothing. nothing yeah you know so yeah, it's it's super interesting, man. Because I mean, like, you, it it's really like a bird's eye view of things. And I mean, have you? What's the most impressive example that you've seen of this kind of thing in place? Because I mean, if you also look at, you know, sort of the famous coaches that you can think of too, they were also weird and out of the box and doing things in a slightly different way, right? I mean. Um, Phil Jackson, right? The 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 Bulls coach. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know much about him apart from what I saw in the the last dance documentary. Yeah. He was a guy that was sort of bringing in all sort of different ideas and letting things float, and it seemed to be like a very, I don't know, person centered coaching rather mm. than coach led, or at least that's what it seemed. Have you got any good examples yourself that you've seen? Um, well, I think I think there's pockets of, of good examples everywhere, isn't there? But um, um, I, you know, I couldn't I couldn't say specifically off the top of that. I mean, you, you see, not that I've been a part of. I mean, you see things. I mean, what one one thing that is worth mentioning actually, um, and I mentioned the chat before, uh, a, a guy that we collaborate with quite a bit from Australia with. And I always get it wrong. I can't remember exactly which, but he works with one of the um, uh, AFL teams in Adelaide. And the way the way they go about um, basically their athlete preparation, their practices, they use really cutting edge, really forward thinking, innovative, very player centred. Um, or what, when I say player centred, there's lots of uh, co-design with the players. So so. The players will be integral to designing the practice sessions uh, and identifying opportunities or uh, maybe constraints on their performance. 
Um, now, that might not seem that uh, way out there, but uh, in professional sport, I think that's pretty uh, pretty unique. Yeah, the extent to they, they go to, the extent, you know, to develop players, it's really, really quite um, impressive. So, uh, circling back to the PhD. Yeah. <laughs> He's loving this, isn't he, Mike? You know, it's... <laughs> or not. Yeah, I, 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 I like it. It's just, it's so complex. What, where does the analysis come in? So what, what are you... I, I still don't understand. How are you classifying these or, or, or segregating them into whatever category, yeah. right? Like, I, I don't... Should I, would it be if I taught you through that the studies, like the way that we've gone about doing the studies? Is that yeah? Walk that me through it. Yeah. Walk yeah, me yeah. through it. So, yeah, like the I, findings I wanna, of each learn. stage. Right. Yeah. So, so well, the first the first task I actually did is I wrote a position paper just to outline exactly what it is I was looking at. You know, um, so that's not a study, but. Well, that sort of set the tone, set the scene for what, what we were trying to do. And then the, the first actual study where we collected data. So we, we interviewed, um, I don't know, about 30 coaches. So there was coaches from uh, children. So, you know, sa Saturday morning or Sunday morning sport where kids go along. So participation coaches. Then we interviewed academy coaches. And then we interviewed like professional coaches. So like, you know, the, the championship Super League coaches. And what we wanted to do is just from their perspective, we wanted to get an understanding of, of all, these, all these different things that we've, we've been speaking about. So obviously the way that I was talking to them, it wasn't all jargonistic and very academic. It was just more getting their experiences about, you know, what sort of things influence the way they design practice, um, you know, what sort of things influence the players, the way they play, and all the uh, all these different sort of questions, ideas about that. And then, and then once we'd done that, then we analysed those into those transcripts uh, and drew out all the. So using a thematic analysis, we drew out all those uh, different themes. Um, yeah, and that and that was a start point really, and then and then to understand more about that from a first hand experience, yeah. So that's when then I was a coach, or I act as a coach in, a, in an academy environment to understand more about that from a first hand experience. So my observations um, over the course of a of a of a season with a, an academy team, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so, so this type of work, Mike, it's highly subjective. Um, you know, it's it's not it's it's done in messy, you know, the messy real world environments um, of of you know everyday life, if you like. It's not um, studies done in labs that you know the that everything is controlled mm -hmm. very very highly. It's it's more, as I said before, highly qualitative, very subjective. Um, piece of work yeah and then the final study um we we then spoke to a range of expert coaches from across the world uh, in in different sports to understand i suppose it was i think it was brooker's question before that how do you start to address some of these these issues um so yeah so that's that's the studies in in order really yeah so when you were interviewing these coaches yeah what it, you recorded what they said yeah how how did you decide what was important what wasn't or did you leave the entire interview as part of the study and in which case you're going off of their opinion off of their hindsight hmm. from what happened and you are it, it's it's an anecdotal study essentially yeah yeah I yeah, look, there's, you know, with, with any, yeah, with any research method, there's, there's challenges, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, so, yeah, essentially what, what you just said we did. So then we, you know, once we had the, the transcripts, you, you know, it's, you're reading through each transcript line by line, you know, three or four times, 
and you're just pulling out key bits. Um, and then it's, <clears throat> excuse me, and then it's through a thematic analysis of these different stages and then event, and you, you start clumping sort of similar themes together uh, and you just keep going through that process until you've got higher dimensions, higher order themes, lower order themes, yeah. Mm. And then that sort, and then you use the, the real rich sort of, um, uh, what the, basically what the, the quotes from the, from the uh, participants, the coaches, to, to bring to life what these sort of higher order themes and dimensions mean. Yeah. And so what, yes. were the, what were the ultimate high factor things? You said before <clears throat> masculinity and um, perfectionism, perfectionism, is that correct? Uh, yeah, sort of that. So this, this idea of imitation, this idea right. of highly disciplined movement. Um, yeah, and then, and then it was understanding how they thought that might influence, the, or not how they thought, how their perceptions of how that influenced um, the, you know, the, the player's behaviour. And what we mean is the, their performance behaviours when they're playing the game. Right. Yeah, so, but remember, it was a, it was professional, well, professional Super League coaches, championship coaches, academy and participation. So although, although, those, although those environments are very, very different and the world's apart, I suppose, we were getting similar themes coming through. Yeah, which which is interesting in itself. Yeah, right. it, it, interesting as well that, <laughs> that a lot of the professional coaches were um, quite. How do I put this? Probably disillusioned, perhaps, with the dominant or the traditional way of doing things, and, and a lot of them did recognise um, the issues with cert with not certain players, but players in general that you know, certain things they, they felt were limiting their development because of this traditional way of doing things. Yeah. So from a socioeconomical standpoint, what did these coaches all say that in common? Socio-cultural. Yeah. So um, what in terms of the, the player performance, Mike, the yeah. in game performance. Yeah. So, well, we termed one of the, one of the um, higher order themes was robotic players. So time again in the, with the professional coaches, they, they kept using this term, players are very robotic. They can only, they can only interact with the environment, i.e. the defensive line or attacking if they're defending, by very prescripted uh, game plans. All right, so, you know, if, if for example, um, you know, in attack you might have three or four or five or six different ways of attacking. And if you take that away from them, they're lost. They just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They always needed this, um, this crutch of the coach to tell them what to do, this game plan, this somatic of, right, we're playing this play or that play or this play. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that it's really about building gamers, right? Like guys that, you know, they can build, they can read the situation, even if it's <clears> something that's predictable or not build the right mental schema and then execute on it as quick as possible. And I guess, yeah. you know, the more creative, I mean, if you look at like the French, the way that they used to play rugby, they were really the only ones yeah. that could ever give the All Blacks a run for their money because yeah. even they didn't know what they were doing yeah. inside their own, you know. Interesting point you just said there. I'll come back to it, Brooks, about gamers. I'll come back to that. But, but let's, but, but what we are, what we're not doing, we're not suggesting that this isn't, you can't do it that way. Of course you can do it that way, but all, all I'm asking is that, is that necessarily the best way to do it? You know, right. it's almost like we've got athletes that are like lemons. They're just pushed around in the environment <laughs> by these external features, i.e. a coach, a game plan. Do you know what I mean? You know, is that really the way you want? I mean, Everybody has different worldviews. Do you know what I mean? My worldview is very ecological. I think that people have the ability to interact with the environment without, without this dominant individual there telling them what to do all the time. Or they can engage, you know, they, they, they see different players. They might spot opportunities to attack the line. They've got, they have got that innate ability to do that. You know, and I, and I think we should really try and embrace that. Uh, 
for you know just from a, a, a player's perspective, and so that's just a, by the side. But but yeah, back to gamers. There's a, an American guy actually called James. I think his name's James G. And a lot of his research. He's an academic. I think he's retired now. But a lot of his research was around applying video game design principles to learning education. And people now have have got hold of that in in sport and applying it to coaching. Uh, and applying it to how children engage or performers, athletes, you know, design practice for them to engage with the game. Uh, so it's really interesting you say that because quite clearly they whoever these people are, design these video games. There's some principles in there that that really engage people. You know, if we re- if we sort of compare it to coaching, they're not told what to do. They sort of find their own level. <laughs> and once they've achieved that level, they go on to the next level. So there's lots of challenge there. You know, there's lots of autonomy to play the game you want to a certain degree. So I think there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of benefits of thinking about coaching as video game design, yeah. Well, it, you know, it's funny because it seems like, especially nowadays, you see it for like the youth, it becomes so serious so quickly. I mean, the parents put so much fucking pressure on these kids, you know, and it's like, I get, I, I also get it because I think some parts of it, it drives some some of these kids forward. But at the same time, it, they do, It my intuition is, is that they end up getting limited too within it because it's all become about just do the job that people are expecting of you. They, they want you to fit into this position rather than you being, a, you know, an individual and sort of finding your own language within it. Do you understand what I mean? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you have to look at youth sport across well. I mean, maybe the Northern Hemisphere. Kids, people aren't, kids aren't playing youth sport anymore. Right, it, right. You know, the numbers are dwindling rapidly, aren't they? And I think it's the same for North America. You know, just, there's better things to do. I'm going to... Then play sports? Well, well, play structured sports. I'll, you know, I'll grab, there's a skate park near where we live. It is rammed every single day I drive past it. It's rammed. There's no coach there. They're working out, you know, and they're doing all these mad tricks and whatnot. You know, there's something in that. And, you know, there's no wonder kids are going to choose to play video games and go and get screamed at and told what to do. And they've got no sort of freedom of expression. There's no autonomy or agency to to try the game that they want to try the way they want to try it, you know? So there's no, there's no wonder that kids are dropping out of structured sports. Yeah. But I mean, it, it all stems also from the way that the, 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 the schooling system is, I mean, we, yeah. it was, it's, it, it was designed to make obedient workers, right. Yeah. In this way. Yeah. And I mean, we're, I don't know, a lot of the times that we're always told like, Oh, a coach is going to get, be the one that gets you better. And I mean, me and Mike talk about this a lot too. And I mean, I, I keep thinking that we need to put Roffers and Tim in touch because I think them two would get on really well, Mike. Don't you think? Sort of this, um, like, a lot of the times people have just lost the ability to play. And that's really where the creative parts are and everyone can sort of become an artist in their in their expression and that can be also through sport movement too. Mm, yeah. I mean, one thing I must say as well, it, no, you know, it's not to say the role of the coach is or coaches are bad. And I don't think, I think there's a, the majority of coaches, 99.9% of coaches are there for the right reason. They want to help people get better, whether it's high performance, it's kids sport, whatever. They're probably just a little bit misguided in the way it's delivered and the way or this, what they see their role as in that process. Um, So I think we just need to reconsider the role of the coach. But as we've said at the beginning, how you change that, who knows? It's so complex. There's so many different factors influencing that. It's it's a real challenge. So, Ruffers, I mean, obviously we've known each other for a long old time. And, you know, I had the pleasure or, let's say, the pain in the arse of having you as a coach for a couple of years, <laughs> right? And This could you... be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so, was you implementing some of this kind of stuff with us? Because, I mean, I remember... You know, there was a lot of sort of figure it out, just play, play, play. You know, it, 
was it was you already implementing it then yeah i think look yeah i mean it's great to reflect back on then i mean i think i got lots of things wrong then right. but i think the intention was you know if i'm being brutally honest with myself probably the intention was right i yeah. wanted to try and let you lads not figure things out for yourself necessarily, but, you know, I didn't want to put in these real rigid game plans, these rigid structures, which would have been easy for right. me as a coach, you know, get, get to here. And then I want you stood there, you stood there and I want you to play this way. These are your options. But I suppose I mean, I it was interesting too, because the context is, is that we had a bunch of machines. Like we had a super fit mm. physical team with very good sort of athletes but none of us, not many of us could play really rugby league, which is different than rugby union, especially compared to sort of Leeds Met that were all rugby league boys for their whole life, yeah. right? So you did actually the opposite of probably what anyone else would have done. And you kind of, you know, put us in the environment to try to sort of figure it out ourselves and to probably counter it with the opposite of what we were going to experience through traditionally uh, coached rugby league players. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I mean, if the way I would try to do that at Loughborough, that would have been very difficult in a with players that had played for, you know, since they were six, seven years uh, of age. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that would have been very difficult because their expectations. But yeah, I think so. Going back to Loughborough, I think the intention would be the same. But I suppose I'd, there's a there's perhaps there would be a little bit more facilitation. Um, probably a bit more guidance at certain times about, um, you know, or sort of guiding you maybe towards different ways of doing it rather than be a, <laughs> so a bit more hands-on and a, le a little bit less more hands-off, I suppose. But that was, I mean, that was what, 10 years ago? No. Yeah. Yeah. 10 years ago. So I suppose that was just where I was in my development as a coach um, at that moment in time. Uh, you know, it'd be, as I say, the intention would be the same, but I think, you know, it'd probably be a bit different. And I would say that that definitely come across because, I mean, the trainings were still fucking rough, right? Like, I mean, we didn't train easy. It weren't like sort of, let's just go and have a kick around, you know, on Tuesday morning or whatever. And, you know, whatever probably you, you maybe gave freedom with in terms of like actually playing the sport, we were trained you know, really, you know, in a good way, mm. right? When you say, I mean, fucking hell, we used to do the rip pit and yeah. there was a lot of stuff about, you know, you got, you know, I don't like really the word mental toughness, but I don't know if there's any other way of really kind of saying it than that, mm. you know? And I don't know if also that was influenced by your, you know, because what was you, you in the Royal Marines, weren't you? Army commando, yes. Commando. Command right. I was an army commando, not a Navy. But um, yeah, I suppose, so with, with I mean, I it was, you know, it was about op offering representative sort of environments. So trying to mimic, I mean, in rugby league, it's difficult as with American football, because if you do that every single session, players are just going to break down. So it was identifying certain points throughout the season where we could perhaps train so it's more game-like, you know, so it, as in intensity, because, you know, we, we know it, skills are more likely to transfer into the game if, if they're practised uh, in a representative manner. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that was a big part of it. Um, yeah, definitely. But, I mean, it, it just kills me when you're watching, certainly when you're watching rugby league, when you just see people are just executing these pre-planned plays. And, you know, they're no more effective. In, I mean, when you get to the elite level, at times, yeah, you know, you get quite a bit of success with some teams, not all, but they all play the same way. Um, you know, so why not Why not give the players the opportunity to try and work out ways to break that line down? You know what I mean? Mm. Collective ways to do that. Because they're the, they're the people that are playing the game, not the coach. Yeah. They're in the thick of it. And, you know, in, there's lots of intelligent players that, have lots and lots of detailed insights into the game. You know, they, they, they understand the nuances of, of when you're attacking different areas of the field, you know, what what that means, what opportunities that uh, provides, 
what you know intu- intuition tells them that certain players can maybe beat other players and that you know if I go on attack certain areas of, uh, of the pitch against certain players I'm more likely to get success they know that but that's taken away from them straight away the minute you put in a, um, a game plan or a structure mm. or whatever it is you want to call it, you know? I hear you. So in, in rugby, I mean, it is, it is a constant state of free flow, right? Like yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of on, on the spot thinking with these guys, football, every play is separated by 40 seconds, 30, 40 seconds of time. Let's or not, not time out, but like, time to sit there yeah, yeah. and and consolidate and think about what play that they want next and hear from the OC or the DC and how to structure it and all this. But it's a lot of if then statements, right? When when the quarterback gets the ball if it's not a running play, it's a series of checks. Check 1, receiver 1, check 2, tight end 1, check 3. If this guy's open, then go there. If this guy's not open, then go there. I, I would assume that rugby is even more so a series of if-then statements, right? And how – so how can you say that there's too much structure in a rugby game comparatively to, like, an NFL game? And then if that's the case, how can guys be robotic in those, in those environments then? What, what, are, what are you what – what are you guys saying in regards to that? I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not grasping it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I'd struggle with the idea of if then statements. I mean, it might be all right if, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a sport, but most sport is quite, it's quick, it's dynamic, it's evolving, it's changing, it's unpredictable. So there's, you know, in rugby or rugby league anyway, um, you know, for, if then statements just, it might be, all right, I can see the wingers dropped. That affords me the opportunity to maybe put a miss pass to the winger because there's a gap there. But that could change instantly. That opportunity, so that's then not an if then step. It's, it's something else. So, and have you really got time to process that information um, in this real quick dynamic game? I'm not so sure. So, um, I don't know. But, but what, so just, your question there, Mike, the robotics. So how do I explain it, Brooke? So it's almost like choreographing, it's choreographing plays. So, so what, you know, let's say we receive the ball in in the attacking part of the field. So the halfway, uh, halfway line to the goal, the the sticks, the H. So they might, I don't know, they might have a certain name of a, of a play, which means you want to get to a position on the field yeah, a, a very specific or closer to that position as possible. And then you'll have players set up in a very specific shape. Yeah, so you'll have players stood in, you know, like on a chessboard or, mm-hmm. and then you, you'll play. So with to be fair, I mean, within that shape, within that setup, you have got options. It's not saying you will do this, you will, but these are then your options to do whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. But the problem comes when you, the problem is, pra- so teams will practice that over and over and over and over again. Now, let's just say you're in a position on that, in that structure, in that shape where you might be an option runner, let's say. So you are an option to receive the ball. Mm-hmm. If you're con- continually practicing that way over years and years and years, it can make you very redundant or, there's a sociological term um, that colleagues use um, called uh, docile bodies. It comes from uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault, a French philosopher, where, uh, like Brooke was saying before about different systems, school systems, prison systems, essentially they're trying to make docile bodies. Mm-hmm. And so over time you become do- almost docile in the sense of you're not seeing these opportunities, you're not reacting to what's going on in the, where the real information is, i.e. the defensive line. Um, and you see, you see it when you watch the games, like, you know, the, there's opportunities because 
players are not where, you know, defensive players are not where they should be or there's a real big gap or whatever, but players are so obsessed with this, setting up this structure that, you know, they're missing all this important information. They're not, they're not responding to these opportunities for action. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, <laughs> sorry, I, 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 this is, this is like really interesting to me. So I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, get, sure. I got a million and one questions. <laughs> it's so, it's so funny though, because, you know, if you look at like an American football, it is so uh, strategic and organized. Oh, it yeah. is so for like us from like, if you, if you've played rugby, you know that the beauty of the game is all the bits that you have no idea about. I mean, you might have a couple of different plays, but it's really, it's the stuff that you're, that, that, that happens while you're in flow because the game's always moving. Whereas yeah. American football, it's start and then for what, 10 seconds, stop, reassess. And so I don't know how it would fit into, into such a, into such a, a model, but I do know that there are some American football teams that play really quick, right? Yeah, I've heard that. Fast mm. pace, mm. and they're trying to basically um, uh, uh, make quicker decisions rather than sort of slow their game down yeah. and always run the same sort of patterns and stuff like that. So, so, so just a, a question for you, Mike. So you know, because obviously you've got good insights into the game. So, like, is the, you know, when the, you, did you call it the DO, the defensive, or what was it you called him, the attack, the offense defense coordinator with he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, CDC, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, is it never? Is it never to the quarterback? What do you think? Or is it always right? You're going to do this. Is it? Is it a collaboration? It, or it depends how good the quarterback is, right? So you got right, a guy right. like Peyton Manning, uh, who yeah, was yeah. a legendary quarterback. The oh, offense. Yeah. Uh, uh, this was what was told to me by a running back that played with them. Said the offense coordinator didn't say a word during the meetings. It was just Peyton Manning sitting there with a the laser pointer. Ripping, yeah, yeah. ripping everything yeah. apart, right? But, I mean, you go into other organizations, it's, it, it, it's you know, player by player, uh, guy by guy, you know? Like, that's, so yeah. it's, it's just yeah. a different, different scenario. But in regards to uh, guys being able to think on their feet and being reliant on systems, uh, there's a defensive back, and this was told to me by Devin McCourty, uh, who's... Uh, 11 or 12 year football player in the NFL. Like he's, he's legendary, a possible future hall of famer. And he said that there's this guy, Darrell Revis and Revis is another future hall of famer. Possibly. I I don't know. um, Who was known as the best in the game for a decade. And he was a cornerback and the cornerback's job was to guard the wide receiver who was one of the fastest players on the entire field, guess what move he was going to make and try to guard him and stop him from getting the ball. So Revis was a walking if-then statement. The guys lined up a certain way on the field. All right, there are 15 routes he can possibly run. As soon, and this is what McCourty told me, as soon as he took his first step, all right, we know there's five down. Now we only have 10 left. Second step, all right, now there's three left that he can do. Third step, he can only do this or this. Judging by the hips, we're going to do this. And that's why he was so successful. But he was constantly, he was a free-flowing corner. He was a a, a free-flowing guy where he was able to rely on that system in order to, so it's robotic. It's absolutely robotic in that sense where it's process of elimination and it's nothing but if-then statements the entire time. That's why I wonder, like, they're just that... You could have robotic players, and he is fluid as fuck. So don't get me wrong. He's, he's a phenomenal athlete. But they just don't have the right system, or they just don't have enough information. Like, you can give these robotic players, you could, you could assign them to certain roles, and they could be super, super successful. You just need to expose them to, to more stimuli, to more information, so they can process it better. So, yeah. <laughs> the light, so, Re- Revis, the, right, the guy who's... If the walking if then statement. So, so this is where this this what I was talking about before. This different worldviews come in. So, so you you're you're looking at that from a very information processing, i.e., step one, right? But I would but would not argue the way I see that and the world view, my worldview of this Revis guy is that he's just highly receptive to 
the environment to the player, the environment, you know, and and how he's got. So that's a, that would be a more of an ecological uh, ecological worldview. Do you know what I mean? He's just a highly attuned individual. Yeah, it's not. It's it's. Well, you know, it's whatever whatever your opinion. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but my view would be he's highly attuned to the environment. He's receptive to all this information. He, he can attune to this information. He's not he's not been made docile by this highly structured, or he might he might have come through that approach. But you know, he, he can he can attune to these uh, this environment information. So very different to maybe more of a an information processing approach. Yeah. So I I think it's exposure. I think it's proper exposure, right? So there's there's almost, in my mind, some people need less exposure. Some people need more exposure. You're you're absolutely right. He's highly attuned. Like this is this was his niche. Like he he found what he was good at, and he fucking did it better than anyone else on the planet at the time, right? But even those guys, I don't know. I feel like they just haven't been exposed. I think there's just not enough exposure to specific stimuli to yield the wanted adaptation. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's, so that's the framework that we come from that, um, you know, practice that's very rigid and very structured. You're not exposing players to the, or the information's there, but over time you're narrowing, you're narrowing this exposure to very minute uh, information points. Whereas you want to be exposing them to this rich field of information or to get technical, we would call that a landscape of affordances. So an affordance would be a uh, an action opportunity that invites action. Yeah, which you, so what you've just described to me would, with Rivas is exactly that. And he's probably been exposed to all these, whether that's as a kid, as a very young age, he's played lots of sport on the park or with his mates, uh, you know, backyard games, you know, and, and over time he's really developed that. Mm. really well, interesting Ruffers, I mean let's say if we pick an example like you know football and say like let's say like Brazil Brazil have uh, a reputation for producing some of the most creative football players and I guess that they're doing it very differently than they would in back home in England right so you got kids that are I don't know playing without shoes on making goalposts out of whatever a t-shirt as, as a goalpost kind of thing is that a really rich environment then for this sort of for all of these socio um, cultural uh, limitations to sort of be lost and then that's where the bubble works well or is it what would you give in as, as a good example for that yeah so there's a there's a guy that writes about this he's over in uh, a Brazilian guy actually he's over in um I think it's the University of Otago in New Zealand. So uh, Lewis Uihara um, has written extensively about this. So, yeah, so, I mean, like you say there, Brooks, I mean, you know, a lot of these kids are growing up in the favelas, on the beach, they're playing in these different environments. They're, they're exposed, you know, they might, one day they might be playing against kids their own age. The next day they're playing against kids older, younger, whatever. So they've, they've got a real rich... Um, range of practice experiences um, and they've been so Mike's thing about exposure they're exposed to lots of different information Um, and you know they they might never ever be coached in a structured sense Um, and and, you know if you if you think about um, um, the way like say the way they play the game they have a very unique way of playing you know, the, the way they might, the way a very traditional British way of how we might beat an opposition player, you might have two or three options. Whereas in Brazil, the way they beat players in terms of the one on one duel, they, they have a, it's so unique, you know, and that's, and that's probably what makes them very, very special, very unique in the way they play the game. Yeah. So, and, and, and Luis Uihari, he's argued the fact that, what supports that is Brazil's uh, socio-cultural backdrop. You know, it's, um, you know, and, uh, what's the uh, the dance? Paleda, Padella, I think. It's, and it's, 
it's naked dance, I think it uh, relates to. It's all about movement and the way they dance and with the music. And you can see that's the way they play the game. And that's okay. like a real sort of uh, tradition that, that Padella or... You mean that, cap comment. Capoeira? Like no, where... it, I don't think so. They've but got so, it, mad, so many different yeah, styles of dancing. You know, it's all about interacting with the movement and the environment. And you can see, you can see the way... They play, you know, with, with the hip swerve and the hip movement and these types of things. So, so yeah, I mean, that's a root, that's one example, I think. Um, and then we see the opposite, don't we? Different. Uh, so, this, so what we're talking about, we, we've used a, a, a term from um, from a philosopher, Wittgenstein. It's called form of life. So we, so the way we've categorised all these different sort of socio-cultural ideals is through a, is through something called a form of life. Um, so it's a it's a form of life. It's a, a real established way of doing things, um, and we see other examples, don't we, that are very opposite to that. It's very rigid. It's very coach centred. It's very um, restricting on the athletes. So yeah, right. so yeah, I mean that, that's a really good example. As I say, it's been writ written about extensively. Yeah, so mm. so what I would love to ask them, Rafa, is I mean. I remember quite some years back now, but there were at one point we were actually planning on working together, right? And trying to run a team. And we were even in talks about, I uh, can't remember now which team it was that maybe it was going to come. Maybe we shouldn't even mention it, but yeah. we were talking about ways that we might try and, you know, create the culture. And we were talking about going maybe to Poland and looking for some, for some oh, big yeah. guys yeah. to draft and, and put them as big artillery and stuff. How would you, how would you create, you know, let's say you were going to coach rugby league again, like with the same group of boys you had with us. How would you, how would you set that up now? What would be the best case scenario? Um, well, look, I mean, it's quite clear that the, the, the sort of players that I'd be trying to develop, I think it's quite clear. But um, and the, the the way you go about doing that, I think it's just you, well, you've got to have player engagement first and foremost, and it might you know it even informs the the type of players that you might try and recruit, um, you know, and you can see quite quickly which players are expecting maybe a very traditional way, and which players sort of buy in or like the you know maybe more of an ecological approach to to uh, developing players, so. So yeah, it's just. I mean, first and foremost, I think you've got you, you know you've got to be as a coach. You've you've got to have a definite um, philosophy of the way you're going to do things, and I think it's important that that's underpinned. Well, my opinion is that it's underpinned by a theoretical framework of learning. So, so you've got this you've got this approach that's you know that's underpinned by theory, and that that will that will protect you from maybe changing things or you know, buying into these different coaching fads that can come along, to, you know, from time to time. So, so I think it's just been very sort of, um, you've got an idea in your mind how you might do that. And then it's, it's just a long process, isn't it, of working with the players to try and support that way. Um, but you've got, to have, I mean, at the end, I mean, that, what I've just described is a very coach-centred approach. It's all about me. But, you know, you've, it's... It, it's all a little bit as well. It's got to be about what maybe the, the attributes the players have got and what they can bring to the table. But it will definitely be about co-design and pulling on the, the coach's insight, uh, sorry, the player's insights about the game and how it can maybe expose opposition teams and all these types of things. So, yeah, so it would definitely be a two-way process. I'd, I'd definitely try and implement this department of methodology idea where you've got all these different uh, sub-discipline specialists working together. And even, I know it might sound stupid, but it's even the way that um, you're situated within the club. You've all got, you know, we're all in the same office. You're always sharing ideas, bouncing ideas off each other. You can't really try and operate a hierarchy that the coach is king and, or the head coach. It's more of a collaborative effort or ultimately that someone's got to have the final decision. But do you get what I mean? It's not a, a very definite hierarchy where uh, people feel they can't input their ideas. So, yeah, there's some, those there's some things that I definitely try and try and work by. Definitely, 
Did you ever read Principles by Ray Dalio? No. It's Not an really idea done, no. meritocracy. So your hierarchy isn't necessarily based on, you know, where, where you are in the pecking order. It's how good your ideas have been. And they mm. quantify everything that you've had. Good idea, bad idea. What was the outcome of that? And then you move up the ladder. And they actually have like baseball cards, playing cards with stats. Hey, this person's had 72 good ideas and 144 bad ideas. Let's not listen to that motherfucker. So what do you, what do you think about something like that? If you were a, uh, you, you just literally, they keep, they keep marks of everything. And by the way, this guy has like the best hedge fund in the fucking world. The most yeah, successful well, hedge fund. Yeah. Well, it comes from business, doesn't it? Then and this, these capitalist ideas. I mean, that, I ain't really down with that, but um, whatever. Um, yeah, mate. I, because it, again, just bec because someone's moving down, it doesn't mean they're going to have a good idea next week. Do you know what I mean? That totally. we might need but, to listen but to. But if someone, if you're absolutely right, you're yeah. absolutely right. And some of the best ideas come from people that have nothing but ideas all the time all yeah. day long and all of them are fucking bad but the more ideas you have ideas yeah. beget ideas beget ideas beget ideas yeah. and then hey you know even a blind squirrel finds a fucking nut every now and then right <laughs> so so i hear you but if you have a guy that has tons of ideas and a lot of them are fucking wrong and a guy that has tons of ideas mm. and a lot of them are right mm. you tend to lean more towards that guy so it's not yeah. necessarily the hierarchy based off of oc dc head coach linebackers coach or running backs coach right mm. it's based off of well he's had a pretty good success record what do you yeah. think about that yeah i suppose ideas in business though are maybe more quantifiable aren't they you know i don't know excuse my ignorance but invest in this or you can see it you can see an instant result and it's quite easy to measure whereas um in sport it's so complex isn't it how do you know if i don't know a different training method in um, in in strength or whatever, it, it could take years to see the to see the result of that. So I, I don't know, mate. I don't know if it's that straightforward in sport, Mike. I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, look, you might have ideas. I suppose they, they come in different ways, don't they? As well, like some ideas, you might see an instant result. I I don't know, pick this player over this player, or you know, you might want to do, try and do these sort of things in the game. I don't know, but it, I don't think it's that black and white in sport, is it? It's so complex. I don't know. I think it could be, right? Where if you say, hey, let's run this defense. All right, we're going to give that a whirl. Yeah. Well, we just got our asses kicked in. We're not running that fucking defense. Bad idea. Against one team, but it might work against another. Possibly. Maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah, Possibly. just, I don't know, this like... This, I don't know, the, the idea that you've got the card that's at the bottom of the pile and I've got the card that's at the top of the pile, it's very sort of egocentric in it. I don't know. It's a different way of, I, I think it's just a different way of looking at looking at it and of, of trying to answer the question yeah. of how can we, how can we maximise our chances of, of success? And it's two different ways. I think it sounds, it sounds like there's a lot of like sort of Eastern philosophy that uh, approach that is is embedded in some of these ideas too, wouldn't you say? In Mike's ideas, no, in, in within your ideas, in terms of you know making sure that it's much it's not so much top down approach and it's much more about everybody sharing ideas and this sort of um, uh, you know past doesn't necessarily mean future and you know like not just everything's relying on. It's not always about the metric of numbers moving in the right directions or not. You know, that's what it seems like to me. It seems much more like you're uh, trying to create the, the the richest environment for sort of creativity and, and, and stuff like this and things that haven't been seen before in sport. That's what it seems like in my in, in, in my head, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Just I suppose with with. Um... With more of an integrated approach, I suppose what 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 we're suggesting, books, is that it, it's it's a better way of solving problems. Do you know what I mean? It's right. It, you know, and, and if we're taking an ecological dynamics approach, it, it, small changes in a system 
yeah, i.e. The, the human system or in a subunit or a team, can you can see really, it's not monotonic, do you know what I mean? It's not like a small change means a small change. It could be a small change in the system is sees a massive change in performance. So right, I think right. that's important as well. The, you know, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is aligned to Eastern philosophy. I'm not sure, but um, I just, I just think it's a more vibrant ecosystem. If you've got people sharing ideas and all working together to, to collaborate, to, to improve performance. I just think that's a lot healthier. Um, it, it, it seems like, I mean, the evidence in, especially with something I recently heard, you know, everybody knows what a computer mouse is, but no one would be able to build one. And it, it requires a team of people, all sort of the plastics and, you know, the, 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 the labor are putting it all together. And then the, you know, the, the microchip manufacturers and all these people working together, they together, they can create something that's very, you know, special and, and, and valuable Whereas sort of alone, you couldn't do it. I mean, you, I guess I, I, I like that kind of idea. Um, but I don't know how it would work in such a thing like, I mean, it's so different co compared to the way that some things are done right now, especially like American football. Not that I have experience, but from the stories that I hear. But I, and I guess, you know, you know, all sports are different, right? I mean, say something like table tennis, you know, that is just all about responsing you know, there's, it's hard to probably set up certain plays and moves. So that sort of sport is, would be so far away from what you would expect in an American football where sort of having a strategy and, and someone else telling you kind of what to do based on what they see and running different algorithms mm. on, on certain things. So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, yeah. mate. It's just... It, it's yeah, I think as well, it, it, it clearly re requires certain... Uh, certain individuals do you know what i mean not not everybody would be willing to work that way quite clearly you know and again depending on the form of life that, that influences you and uh maybe make sure the way you are you know you've got to be sort of ready to share ideas listen to ideas you know admit when maybe things mike's card system <laughs> when it ain't working that well do you know what i mean it, it so i think it takes a very certain type of individual to maybe operate in that in that way yeah i mean in sport as well it's very um egocentric isn't it it's all about you know dominating your opposition and being the best and and whatnot so and and you know a lot of ex-players get involved with with coaching so you know i'm sure those ideals manifest in coaching practices as well so um yeah well i think it's even bigger i mean you know the majority of coaches that I know, they want to be the reason why now they're, they're seeing success. They want to they want to be the sole reason for that. So, you know, and I guess... Not a lot of coaches. All well, coaches. Maj well, majority. That's, that's why you're coaching. Sure majority, you, you, right. You, right? Like, hey, I'm going to do it right. better than the last guy. Like, that's why I'm applying for this job. Especially in pro sports. I mean, I think, you know, sort of like children's sport and stuff, I guess that there are some... Some uh, some coaches there that are probably just in it more just for the for the fun of it, but in pro sport, yeah, I mean it's yeah, that's that's I, the name of the game. Just like yeah, in, to win any any kind of research, right? What's what's the goal of research? To find something, to fucking figure something out. This works, this doesn't work, right? right. Like that's what we're trying to go towards in in fucking everything. It's called progress, right? And I mean, especially as. You know, you're obviously financial, like sports, pro sports is a business. So you're financially rewarded if you do win and succeed, right? So how I always thought like to, you know, let's say, for example, a big organization, it can be any, let's say, whatever, Manchester United, right? Let's say if they were to take this to the absolute extreme, Rothers, right? From a top to bottom down. So all the youth academies, everyone, right? And they were to implement, the best kind of practices from this. How long would you sus sus suspect it would take to see the fruits of that? You know, because I guess at the beginning, I mean, I know a bunch of guys too. They say that they almost feel like they've forgotten how that they how to really play sometimes in pro sport because they've just been drilled to constantly. You know, so there'd be an adaptation window. How long do you, do you think until you'd see see it's kind of working? 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, I think with with certain teams or with, with I think look, play, players are not you know human human beings, individuals are very smart things, aren't we? We, you know, we. Um, and quite clearly, eh? <laughs> I think well, it depends. <laughs> well, yeah, but we're, you know, so I think, and you see it, don't you? You know, teams. I think teams and people, these team synergies, collective team synergies, and people playing in, you know, playing in these teams, they can they can adapt quite quickly. Well, again, this is, depends what worldview you, you, you're looking at it through, but this issue, this question, but I think they can adapt quite quickly. Um, but you know, in, in the problem you've got is professional sport, isn't it? So if you don't, if you don't see, well, if you don't see success, not change. If you don't see success, then you you're out the door, aren't you? Quite quickly, um, you know, NFL, foot, Premier League, whatever. Mm. So you, you, you're not always afforded those opportunities. So or, or that time to change things. So so I think the key word you said is it's got to start with youth players where really results shouldn't matter. It's not about beating the, the next team. It's about developing the players to then filter into the first team, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you could change things pretty quickly, but it has to be a collective approach, doesn't it? It's no, it's no point in, you know, um, maybe getting football players to, to, to play in a different way or whatever it might be in one environment and then in another environment, it's still very, every, it's got to be very, it's got to be a collective approach across loads of different environments. Um, and then, and then you might see change. I don't know. Uh, but, but in terms of time, I don't think you could put a specific time on it's a, it's a dynamic evolving system, isn't it? That's constrained by lots of different things. Um, and therefore, it, it, the way it organises is dependent on lots of different constraints. So, um, I'm not so sure. But, but absolutely, pe people, individuals, athletes have got the ability to evolve and change. You know, you, you see it from a strength perspective, don't you? Surely. Oh, you can see it on, you know, every, on, every, on every element that's involved and contributes to sport performance. You can see it. There can be improvements and you know, there can be progress and regress. I yeah. Mean. And, and I think, you know, if we, if we, let's say, uh, the, is it Rivas, Mike, the chap you're talking about? So if you want to develop whatever that position is that he played in, if you want to develop more Rivas's, then I'm pretty certain that it's very responsive to the attackers, what they're doing. I think you could do that, you know, over time, if you're getting people or athletes to, to practice in a very certain way, I do think you could develop more highly responsive uh, players. Absolutely. In the same way you could develop, you know, physical attributes in certain ways through different training protocols. Um, yeah. You know, this, this essentially it's back to ecological psychology. It's the perception action system. Yeah. Um, and if you think so, Another theory that I'm, write, I'm writing about at the minute is actually something called niche construction theory, where um, there's some criteria in that, that and, it, and it, it comes from ecology, that, um, that the first one is that, you know, athletes, or the way I've categorised it, athletes and coaches have the ability to manipulate and change environmental conditions, i.e. practice settings. And then as a result of these practice settings, players can be more highly attuned to perception and action or sorry, their perception and action systems can be more effective and therefore they, they can become more attuned to these different opportunities for action. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's the case. But the problem is, you know, they're not, not all environments support those types of behaviours, do they? That's, that's the issue. You know, if you're running set plays after set plays in practice, then all you're going to be used to is certain conditions at certain time points. Not, oh, you know, you're not going to see all these different things going on. You know, it's like, back to Mike's point again about Rivas. I mean, if you, if you compare that to cricket, where you have 
uh, you know, they practice in nets, they practice with these ball projection machines. So, so like in baseball, I think would be a same analogy where, you, you know, if you've got hit, uh, hitters, batters, whatever they call in baseball, that are hitting the ball off these ball projection machines, they're never going to attune to what the pitcher's doing ever because they're not experiencing it only in competition. You know, but if you want more, if you want more perceptually attuned hitters, batters, to what the pit, to the types of uh, bowls that the pitchers are going to do, then you've got to practice in these real world conditions. You know. Yeah, and I mean, we're wasting so much unnecessary time, energy, and effort, and also adding elements of risk that are just completely unnecessary. Doing some stuff that I guess has no no real transfer over but a lot of the time it's just well this is what we did when I was a pro so this is what you're going to have to do you know what I yeah. mean yeah so Roffers Mike you got anything else for Roffers or should we let him go and have his dinner no his you, you you go eat bro we've had you on the horn now for over an hour and a half <laughs> so Roffers anything else you want to add mate or anything no just uh, enjoyable chat really just yeah Good, uh, good practice actually for me. Uh, Viva that will be in a f uh, right. in a few months. My PhD yeah. Viva, yeah, just different perspectives and different questions. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, cool. We'll yeah. stay on a second, Mike. You want to hit the cancel the recording? All right, let me let me turn. Uh, by the way, do you want do you want to be found? Where can everyone find your work? How do, how do they reach you? Do you want any of that out there? Or are you good? Oh, well, I'm not on social media. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, what, I've, what I'll do is I'll send I'll send Brooker me my research gate. Uh, it's basically it's like um, I suppose it's like Facebook for academics. It's where you put all your work, okay? And people can follow it and all that. So I'll send you the link to that, and okay. if you could share that, that would be useful. Yeah, perfect. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't do social media though. <laughs>